don't even know where to start. You know, Tracy was asking about, uh, or not asking, but talking about the BOJ. And Tracy, are you here? Yes, I'm here. I'll just let you do it. So um, I, we were all having a conversation. I don't know if Anne Marie's here, um, but we were talking about um, like the JGBs and kind of what's going on with that market. Oh, you want to you, talk you, about that, that a little bit? You, yes, and I did a lot of con, you know, because uh, Louis Gavay is really, you know, Gavcal is is located in Asia. They moved to Asia, uh, so they have a really good eye. So it's a really good place to jump off at. There's a lot of stuff. All right. So when you, so what do you want to talk about? What what the Bank of Japan did? Because I'm going to give you my opinion, and uh, I've been a Bank of Japan follower for probably 45 years. Because when I started trading, the yen was 360 to the dollar. And uh, I, I've watched the BOJ <coughs> is a very important player. So yes, you know, they took the widow maker and actually allowed people to make money, even though I don't know how many people were really positioned that way. You know, a lot of people going into that, by the way, were short yen. Now, I had blogged about it, don't be short yen, the end was undervalued. And, you know, I said, I don't know when it's going to turn, but the world cannot exist with the yen being as undervalued as it was because it was creating a lot of underlying tension. Nobody, I was, I, I kept pushing that the G7 needs to discuss this because everybody was starting to raise rates. And of course, the, the Bank of Japan said, no, no, no. And that had to be by design. And actually with Lewis, last, I, I think it was in May of 2022, Lewis and I did a podcast with FRA. It may have been earlier than that. It may have been in actually 2021, and days get away from me. But Lewis raised a point which I thought was interesting. And, and he was raising the point that the yen was weakening because those in Asia wanted the end to weaken because Germany and Japan vie for a lot of business in China. China, China is very important for, for Germany. I mean, if you go look at auto sales and they get producer and they get exported there. And if you look more importantly, I'm gonna put the chart up myself. Uh, hold on one second. Oops. Uh, Matt, do you get, do you you don't get cash charts, right? In the currencies? No, I don't have them. Okay. All right. Let me go do this right now. Um, let's see. Uh, I can't show it to you, peoples, but I will. Okay. So I, I'm putting up a weekly of the euro yen. So it was 2022 when Lewis and I. So if you go back and look at the start of the uh, Ukrainian invasion, uh, that week, the Euro yen was uh, 125.07, okay? And that's the Euro versus the yen. So when it goes higher, of course, the, the yen is weakening or vice versa, the Euro is gathering strength against the yen. So right now we're up, to, we're at 140, almost 141, but we made the high, I believe, in October up at 148. Now, that was like, oh God, I want to say, let's see, probably those were the highest levels we had been, and this was in October in eight years. So, there was really, you know, something that was going on. And Lewis's point was, and I thought it was very interesting because I hadn't thought about that in that regard, but that they were letting the yen weaken to get a competitive advantage to boost up Japan's presence in China versus the Europeans. And Lewis and I actually talked about it so yesterday. So I, it really made a lot of sense. And in the yen, was, you know, for the year last year was, it actually closed against the Euro. If, if, if I'm losing you, you gotta tell me, cause this is not easy stuff. But 
on the year, the euro yen closed down, the, the euro closed higher by, uh, you know, about eight, nine percent. So that was a pretty good move. And off the bottom that was made uh, back in March or May of 2020, the yen had weakened against the euro throughout the whole COVID period by about 25%. Not an insignificant move, by the way. And, uh, and it was done because the Japanese were, everybody else was starting to, to uh, change their monetary policy in regards to inflation. But the Japanese who weren't still incurring enough inflation said, no, we're going to keep, we're going to sustain this. So that's, what they, and then on December 20th, 19th, 20th, when the BOJ met, they raised the yield curve control, which is the parameters that they set on how far they would allow 10 year, the JGBs to move against overnight money. So they widened out from 25 to 50, that caught everybody off guard. And the move in the yen that night was actually very interesting because the, the yen the yen rallied about three and a half four percent maybe a little more uh, because and that wasn't because everybody was merely adjusting they were short and the story they were short yen and you could see it by the action very short yen by the way so uh, that's where we sit today. And now we have the JGB yields. Uh, let me see. Let me get the closest one that I have. I'm sorry, I do have them here. Let me print it. Uh, is everybody following this? I'm taking notes. Yeah, do you want me to put up a yen chart? Well, you can. I'm on your, but I, I can't, I can't do it because I'm on a different computer. I'm, I, I'm trading on my desktop and I'm using my laptop, and I can't. CQG won't let me into both. So, CQG is a pain in the ass like that. Um, but here, right now, the, the last I've seen, which is about 20 minutes ago, the uh, 10 year yields and on, on the JGBs are about. 40 basis points. And that caught a lot of people off guard. And, you know, and again, the, the Japanese bonds got hit pretty hard because they widened out the parameter as to where, and that just meant where the Japanese would, would intervene to hold the rates at. Right? Every, everybody's following that, correct? Yep. Okay. So, and that had, a, that had some effect. It also hit the Nikkei pretty hard for that night, but the Nikkei is actually, and, and I talk about, I, I'm really bullish Japan right now. <clears throat> now, will that result in a higher currency? I think so, but it's like, it's just gonna be a grind and grind, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's gonna take a while to play out. But there is a theme going on in the world and Japan is every bit a part of it. And it's called, it's a German word. I don't, my German is very weak. I understand it better than I speak it, but it's called Zeitenwende. And it comes uh, back in, uh, well, in this, in, in January, February's uh, foreign affairs periodical, the German prime minister, the German chancellor, uh, Olaf Scholz, uses the word and the word it means German words have interesting meanings uh, and they can take on multiple characters, but it means a historical turning point. That's what it means. And he's talking about what the, the situation in Ukraine with, with uh, the energy and, and I know uh, Tracy that, uh, energy is your forte. Uh, not to say that's all you're about, because I, I, I've i listened to you enough and talked to you enough, uh, and going back to uh, uh, Credelli, uh, that this was important. And, and it was changing Germany in certain ways. And now you see that Germany is going to up their defense spending, right? And they're also going to make major changes 
in the flawed policies of uh, of Merkel and so how they're going to do this. And right now they're getting through because it's a mild winter, but they know they have huge problems. And it's how they're going to deal with Russia because don't you know Russia and Germany have been tied at the hip because because Gerhard Schroeder and I would write about this in the blog going back 10 years, you know, people just were not, they don't pay attention to it. You, you know, then everybody a year, about six, seven months ago, the New York Times wrote it. But Gerhard Schroeder, who was the chancellor of Germany, became the chairman of Gazprom pipelines. And so the connection with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream, it, this was all, this was all written in a book, by the way, in 2008 by, uh, the preeminent uh, Russian historian in the country he's since died, uh, Marshall Goldman. And he, he had a book called Petrostate. And in there are all the pipelines, the gas. This was all said and done. Gerhard Schroeder put this into place in the early, in early 01, 02, 03. And then he loses an election. He called early, by the way, that he didn't have to even call. And had he stayed in power for two more years, he loses the election and then takes a job in Moscow with Gazprom. So, and then they had made the decision earlier to turn off the reactors. Merkel just put it into action because the Greens and Green Party in Germany were trying, they were always anti nukes. So, in order to play, so they were going to turn off the nukes. And that now they've had to rethink everything. The Germans are burning more coal than anybody. Because they got caught, you know, caught off here badly. But I will say this: the Germans also built, in eight months' time, three floating LNG platforms, in order to receive imports of uh, liquefied natural gas. Which was everybody said it would take them three to four years. They did it in seven or eight months. So it's helped them immensely, but they're still gonna to have to pay a lot of money for energy, but they're also not turning off all the reactors as soon as they're leaving three reactors on because they know they have a, a situation here. But that's why we're at a historical turning point. And we are also at a historical turning point because Germany is gonna go from a pacifist nation to they're gonna start ramping up their defense production. You know, they just got rid of the defense minister. She was a joke and a half because when the war in Ukraine break out, broke out and everybody said what they were going to send to the Ukraine, she says, oh, the Germans are going to send 5,000 helmets. You know that. That was her response. But she was, she's just a buffoon. She's an absolute idiot. They had to get her out of there. But we are at a turning point. We're at a turning point in energy where so many things are going on here. And that's why Scholl said that. But the German, but the Japanese, four weeks ago, did I send you that? Uh, Maddie, uh, uh, Toby wrote a really good piece using the word Zeitenwende. It's on, uh, you can, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I thought I still had it, but I could be wrong. But it's, Japan is turning. And Japan is now going to get, is going to ramp up their, uh, uh, their defense spending too, by the way. And, they're for the first time since the end of war, they are develop, they are going to develop a counter strike response. You know, they've only been in defensive mode. In fact, that's what it's called. The um, the defense uh, they, they, the state defense. That's what that's all. It, it's always been defensive. The Coast Guard is defensive. Uh, Everything has been defensive, but now there's change afoot because they don't like what they've seen with Ukraine and the way the Russians, you know, and, the, and they have to live in that world and operate in that world. Let's see. That's not the one I want. Let's see if I can find it. Um, so you have these changes afoot and, and with them are going to come all types of things, but that's what makes me bullish on Japan because all of a sudden Japan, uh, I have articles here that I pulled uh, about, uh, from one of the Japanese newspapers talking about in the last, in the third quarter, 
because Jap Japan's on a different uh, calendar year. Their, cal their fiscal year ends March 31st, but in their third quarter, profits, corporate profits in Japan, because of the weekend, were up tremendously. But interestingly, too, CapEx spending in, uh, in Japan was up very large. So lots of things in play here. So I'm giving you a long answer, but it's why uh, Lewis and I spent a lot of time discussing Japan yesterday, and he's very, very knowledgeable uh, on Japan. Uh, so just for the reasons that you're talking about. So it's just not that, can Japanese, oh, here, here it is. I have it, uh, I'm gonna send it to you right now. Yeah. Ira, to uh, tack on to um, <clears throat> your, your Japan yeah. theme, um, just given that the, the kind of the bearish news that's coming out of, uh, of China in terms of their overall, their first population decrease year over year, I think in what, since like 1960 or 61? Yeah, well, why is every, well, let me ask you, who, who's, is this Jake? No, this is Mark. Mark, why is that so important to everybody, by the way? I don't think it's important. It's, it's not important to me. It's just yeah. something that I find interesting because given, and, and I don't know if this would be still, if this is considered hearsay, given uh, China potentially wants to invade Taiwan, right? That's what yep. the media reports. We don't know right. if it's true or not. Yep. But I'm curious as your take on if there would be any unrest in the in Pakram and in Asia specifically, or do you think China would potentially back away from anything because of the overall sanctions of the world that would be put on them? Well, it's a, and it's how a, that impacts Japan's growth story. Well, well, but before I go on, so so Tracy, where do you want me to go for? I'm going to answer marks. I'm not. I have a, it's a very good question, but where else do you want me to take this? Well, my, my specifically, I think I, I kind of wanted to talk about J, JGBs because everybody's kind of talking about how they think, you know, the JGB bond traders are somehow going to break the market. And okay. where I, do you I, see risk in that right now? Okay. All right, so hold that thought. Don't leave that. And let me answer Mark's question because bonds are something I'm phenomenally interested in. And we talked, and that's why Lewis and I got into that discussion yesterday. But Mark, let me, so everybody talks about China invading Taiwan, okay? My response, which I've actually studied this for, and I was, when I was in graduate school at Wisconsin, I studied under one of the premier China, China, analyst at the time, Ed Friedman, who was at the University of Wisconsin, who actually served on Nixon's committee with, you know, to prep him for going to, to go into China. So, and I love, he was a great professor. Uh, uh, so he would say, do you think, and this was kind of resolved in 1970, do you think the United States would risk thermonuclear war to save Taiwan? Well, I guess the question would be, do we actually think thermonuclear war is, is, is really a threat? Do you think okay. anyone's going to pu push the button? Well, let, let me, let, so let me prep you back with this, because this is what I got prepped with when we would entertain that discussion. So in 1957, the Chinese and the Soviets break. So the monolith, you know, that which the United States and the Birchers and everybody who was uh, supporters of Shanghai Shek, you know, and they raised the monolithic uh, communist menace, right? But the Soviets and the Chinese break, it was called the Great Schism, because Khrushchev had come to believe that Mao was serious about embarking upon thermonuclear war. Because the Chinese attitude was, hey, we have 800 million people. We'll survive it. And, and Khrushchev came to believe that Mao was serious, that it wasn't just rhetoric. And he wanted, you know, he, he was in a totally different mindset. So the Chinese and the Russians break. And then the, Chi then the Chinese go off on the, um, um, 
Well, two things happen after that. Uh, uh, Mao starts his hundred, uh, uh, let a hundred flowers bloom, and then the then he goes on on this economic autarky where he wanted to build blast furnaces in people's backyards, so to speak. Um, my mind, but but he goes down that that road. It was insane. And then you get the course in the uh, 60s, the Cultural Revolution, because he's really trying to suppress everything. But he went that road. And, and the, you know what? Who's going to risk it? You could say, well, you know, because, you know, the way we view economics, and it is proved totally flawed, by the way, is through the rational actor model. That that's why a lot of the models that the Fed were, it's based on rational actors that if you do this, people will do this. If you do this, you and here's the outcomes. Well, foreign policy and international relations are built on the same, are, well, based on the concept of rational actors. And the whole concept of what we called, and we still call mutual assured destruction was based on rational actors. Oh, you can't be that nuts. You know, who would, who would put themselves at risk and therefore the United States in order to enforce that of course built the triad so you had an air an air an air response a missile response and missiles from submarine launch that's that's the three prongs of the US mutual assured destruction and the and the fact that you know the whole thing with submarines is you can't trace them and as long as you can launch you know each uh, trident submarine was 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 manned with 160 million, I, I'm sorry, 160 uh, nuclear warheads, because each Trident missile could carry 10 independently targeted uh, warheads to to launch a response to any type of nuclear attack. So that's what it's based on. But you're making an assumption. Now the assumption has been called to question within the last year. Because Putin has talked about tactical nuclear weapons, which are battlefield nuclear weapons, which, by the way, was what brought Henry Kissinger to fame. Because in the 50s, you can go back and look, I think his, his major works were on uh, nuclear weapon, uh, uh, foreign policy and nuclear weapons. And they talk about battlefield tactical nuclear weapons as a response especially in response to the Russians, because the Russians had far more men and tanks under, um, in, in uniform and at the ready than, uh, than NATO did. And so the response from Europe would have had to have been tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. Now, nobody's raised this, but I'll tell you what, they took it seriously in the last eight, nine months when Putin started talking about it. Because what's the first thing that, that uh, Biden said? There will be no US troops in the Ukraine. That was before it even started. That was in January of 2022. And I said, well, that's kind of stupid. You just, you just invited them. And then once the invasion started and Ukraine was crying for a no, for a no fly zone, right? And, and the US said, there will be no planes flying over the Ukraine to ensure a no-fly zone. And that was because they didn't want to ramp it up directly with the Russians. Because they were afraid, and they still are, probably more than anybody wants to talk about, that Putin will, if he's really pushed, utilize battlefield nuclear weapons, or what they call tactical nuclear weapons. Yeah. And once you go down that road, now, this is not 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's its own history. But once you go down that, the whole world map changes dramatically. The United States is being very careful here, to, to the detriment of the Ukraine, by the way. Because a lot more people have had to die because United because NATO, there's no NATO troops in Ukraine. So 
you you say that nobody <clears throat> I, I don't know I, I can't say that with any type of certainty and what are you willing to risk huh. what are you willing to risk to save Taiwan and what are you saving it for because the United States back in the 70s basically agreed that Taiwan was a uh, a renegade province how they were going to deal with it and China promised that it would be resolved through peaceful means right yeah, and I, I mean, I the only I'm a little uneducated on the topic here, but I I think the only not the only, but I mean, to save Taiwan as a proxy for something else potentially, but also their semiconductor business. But you know, we're also building semi some semiconductor plants here in the United States. Apple is uh, moving some of its production out of China, moving it towards India, Vietnam. So it's interesting to see. The, the pull the pull the push away out of out of China a hundred percent I'm sitting on a couple articles I have been meaning to write this blog it's just you get by they're moving you know you know who's the recipient of some major chip firms Japan and that fits that scenario uh there's so and you're talking about moving more and with the you know and that and with Oh, here, you know, here's the article. It was from the uh, Minichi on uh, December 1st. The article was Japan corporate pre-tax profits hit July, September record. Okay, this so that quarter, they hit a record. And that says a lot. And CapEx was up 9.8% in that quarter, which is phenomenal. But there's also discussions about relocating uh, chip plants into uh, into Japan. In Japan with a, with a, I would say a, a very undervalued yen at this point by design mm -hmm. has a phenomenal advantage. One of the other reasons that I have to step back and really think about, you know, about my bullishness and how I'm going to approach it. So, uh, but we're all, we, so I love that we came to this point. Okay. And I, I hope I, that answer, because nobody knows the answer. You know, you listen, I, I never knew we had so many generals. You, if you watch or read or everybody, there's, there are so many opinions. Oh, you know, and of course they speak with the expertise of a retired general or an admiral, you know, I, okay. Everybody's got opinions and they all work for different think tanks or they all work for different corporations. But nobody knows the way that this plays out. Huh. We we saw that Hong Kong is basically already gone, right? But when when back in 2020, I, I took uh, Neil Ferguson to task because he interviewed Kissinger, and I wrote him a, or so I never got back to. Him, but I've actually talked with him because uh, going back to inside the House of Money, he was he helped. Uh, uh, dropped me quite a bit back in 05 and 06 and it was actually at the book launch so I had a chance to meet and talk to him so we've changed so but he interviewed Kissinger and all they talked about was Hong Kong I said Hong Kong and hit Kissinger it's Hong Kong's a sideshow Taiwan is is everything it's been everything at that time for 50 years and Kissinger helped set that up and yet there wasn't a question in that interview about Taiwan it was all about you know Hong Kong and its freedoms and what China China was doing. So we don't know where that goes, and there's a lot of words and energy expended on it. And I'll tell you something else: the Chinese are not worried about being sanctioned, by the way, because back in 1989, after Tiananmen Square, the United States and the West sanctioned the Chinese. That's when Deng Xiaoping was. Uh, President of China. And a year later, when uh, during the first Gulf War, the United States couldn't, couldn't uh, put together the coalition of the willing, you know, going because they used the, the authority of the UN, but they had to get, you know, the Security Council, because everywhere, you know, the, that's why I, la I laugh at the UN. The only thing that they can ever agree on is their disdain for Israel. Outside of that, it's a wild and woolly show because 
the five members, of the, the five uh, permanent members all have veto. So in order to prevent China from vetoing the first Gulf War, the US removed the sanctions that they put in place after Tiananmen Square. And uh, in Ezra Vogel's wonderful book about uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Deng says, first of all, the, the, from his perspective, the, the sanctions were a failure because it raised the ire of Chinese nationalism because they were felt they were being attacked by the rest of the world for what, what was, they, they felt a political, a domestic political situation. And he was very cognizant that, hey, anytime they need you, the sanctions just, you know, become, you know, bait uh, for what they want to do in the rest of the world. So, you know, yes, the Chinese are suffering a little bit, but they're not. But, you know, as Lewis talks about in the podcast, walking away from Russia is easy. Walking away from China, is, China is just too important to the global economy. And everything that partakes in it, not like Russia. You know, Russia is an, an energy and commodity. China is so much more than that. And so many other countries have become semi dependent on the Chinese in, in so many different ways. So it's a whole different game. And that gives China, China always has historically played, you know, a waiting game going back to Kissinger and one of my favorite people ever to read, Joe and Lai. You know, they're famous, whether it took place or not, some people say it didn't, Kissinger's kind of, um, but Kissinger, you know, he, Kissinger had such uh, respect for Joe and Lai, because Joe and Lai was a real revolutionary who really put policy and things into place. And Kissinger's trying to make small talk with him. And he says to Joe and Lai, supposedly, he asked him what he thought of the French Revolution and its emphasis on world history. And Joe and Lai says, too early to tell. So it gives you the mindset of the Chinese. Things take more time to play out and they're willing with their long sense of civilization and their place in civilization have much greater time parameters. So this question gets bandied about by so many people. I don't know the answer in any way, shape or form, but I, but I always come back to ask the same question. Are we willing to uh, embark upon thermonuclear war to save Taiwan? Hmm. Now, let me go to, cause Tracy's question is, and this is my question too. I'm, I'm, so the Chinese unleashed some sell off in the bond market, right? And we know the bonds were no place to be in 2022. And my, my attitude, I look at the, you know, as much as we'll talk about the Japanese bond, and the Japanese bond situation, by the way, is far different, far different. Because when, the, when Japan went into its deflationary period in the 1990s, 97% of JGBs, that's why myself included, I lost money on the so-called Widowmaker because as, as Japan was ramping up its fiscal expenditures, I said, well, Japanese bonds have to break. And I looked at the charts and there, but what, what people like Paul Tudor Jones, or there are people, George Soros, they were all wrong on it because they didn't count on the fact that 97% of the Japanese bond market was owned by Japanese domestics. And that's a far cry from U.S. and German, you know, and Western bottom market, but especially U.S., it's foreigners who own so many, you know, who are who are the uh, backbone of the bond market who own so much. Of it. But it was all, and and the Japanese weren't suffering because they were in deflation. So, if I owned a Japanese bond, if I was a Japanese citizen, and I was getting at that time the ridiculous old levels of 70, 80, 100 basis points, but prices we were actually in deflation. And prices were, were declining by 1%, 1.5%, 2%. I was actually earning a real yield of 3%. 
unlike in the United States right now, where if you own a 10-year bond, and you, let's say conservatively inflation is 6%, right now you're, you're earning negative uh, 2.5%. But I'll tell you what, when, when the bonds were at 2% and inflation was at 2%, 2% one and a half percent. So maybe you were earning a real effective yield of 50 basis points. But right now you're earning negative real yields. So you are in a different situation. But China, but Japan becomes vulnerable to foreign, the foreigners, especially who are looking to sell the bond market, if they pull away totally from yield curve control, meaning they're not in intervening in the market anymore because that's what that would imply. So people are gearing up for it, thinking that they're going to force the Japanese hand, right? So that was, but I'm more negative on European and, and US bonds. I, 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 and I keep scratching my head, Tracy, so I don't know where you're going with that, but I scratch my head and I go, the yield curve is inverted. And for the life of me, why would you buy a 10-year bond today, a 10-year treasury note, and not a one-year T-bill, a six-month T-bill, or a two-year uh, note? Why would you go out in duration when I look at this world? So are we getting to where you want to go? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I think, uh, yes, we are. I don't know. If everybody's just, I think... A lot of people are talking, and I was having this conversation earlier with somebody else, that they think that, you know, they're very concerned what's going on in the Japanese bond market right now, which I am trying to wrap my head around because it's not like, I mean, they ramped up, BOJ ramped up purchases again. It's not like there's a lot on the market, right? Right. There's not. It, <laughs> In fact, until recently, you know, it was a standing joke. The Japanese had it so wrapped up that here was the third largest bond market in the world. And in order to trade it, you basically had to make a uh, reservation. <laughs> no, that, that's not a joke, by the way. There were days that in the world's third largest bond market, literally, there'd be five bonds that traded. So do you think at this point, you know, with the little tweaks that they've done, and, but and the fact that they just went back to purchasing, they kind of went, oh, whoops, that's not working out how we wanted. We're going back to purchasing. Do you think anything, do you think there could be a contagion effect in the Japanese bond market um, across that would spill across other markets? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do. But but I go in it the other way because the way I look at bond, and right now I'm wrong. I'm wrong. This curve, let's see, the yield curve in the US is, I don't even have it, probably 70 basis points, negative 70 basis points, negative. Now, I find that interesting. Again, why would I want to buy a 10 year treasury? I know everybody's talking about recession, right? So we, we're going to, this is a pretty comprehensive situation because the, the talk is recession. So when there's recession, you buy you you buy US treasuries, right? For many reasons, for safety. But I would shorten my duration because first of all, we're expending a friggin' fortune on financing the US deficit now. As the Fed raises rates to curb inflation, the cost of financing the debt raises dramatically. So much so that we're gonna, you know, back when they held rates at zero and the debt was growing and the actual interest on the debt was far lower than it was when rates were 6% at one time. And people said, don't worry about it just, but now that's jumping because they did a lot of their funding in the T-bill and shorter term two and five year note market rather than extending it out like other, and Lewis talks quite a bit about this. We didn't go out to a hundred year bond. We didn't go out to a 50 year bond. 
Yes, we had 30 years, but we didn't even do most of our funding out that far. So the uh, I think the average duration across the uh, the whole fund was about seven years, which isn't that long. The Brits were 13 years because they they extend. So everybody did it differently. And now, as Lewis talks about, and it's right because other people talk about it too. Over the next 18 months. You have a lot of refinancing financing that has to take place. And you're going to jump just like for a lot of people who are in you know, adjustable rate mortgages and things, their funding costs are rising dramatically and have an impact on housing. But that's a whole separate issue. But we are going to the cost of financing the U.S. deficit is going to work. I, I think we may hit some people say 500 billion this year. I think it's going to be closer to 700 to 750 billion in interest costs. Now, that's a very important thing in the United States because now you get into the discretionary spending programs of the budget. And, it, and this whole bullshit that's going on now again with the uh, debt ceiling, that is in a far different place as the interest costs rise to finance the deficit. You know, the deficit's 30 tr 31 trillion now has to be financed. And you start doing the math of what the cost of finance is as stuff starts to roll down. And, and it ties the Fed's hands, whether they want to, they don't talk about it because again, they're trying to get, they're trying to jawbone the market to get what they want. But I, I can't, I, I, am, I am so, but I'm an outlier. Guys like uh, Dave Rosenberg, who I have a lot of respect for, and Lacey Hunt, but they were dead wrong in 2022 to a big level. I mean, we put up the TLT chart if you want to see, you know, just, if you have to remind yourselves of how bad the bond market, bond market did worse than the, than the equity market last year. It was not a good year. Now you say, well, I didn't lose money because I don't have to sell it. To me, that's like buying, you know, uh, uh, Xerox, you know, and you never sold it. Well, I didn't take a loss because I never sold it. Well, it, at some point, you may be in a situation where you have to go uh, raise cash, and then you do have to suddenly realize how much money you've lost. So why would I want to, you know, this is a question I ask, the first question I ask myself every day, Tracy, is why do I want to extend my duration? And I can't come up with an answer. Point. And then, and we haven't even discussed the European and, and Christine Lagarde is in a terrible situation. And I know you follow Europe. I know you follow the world. Christine Lagarde is in a terrible situation. So we worry about Japan, but in Europe, there's 19 different sovereign bonds that the, EC, that, that the ECB had to buy. And they kept, you know, the yields as Christine Lagarde, Christine Lagarde, let me uh, digress for a minute. When Christine Lagarde became the president of the ECB, at her first press conference, she talked about that it was not the ECB's job to, to close yield spreads. In which case, I, I, we may have been on, Matt, when we were talking about this, and the Italian and Greek and Spanish, everything blew out. The spreads versus the, the uh, Germans all blew out. We were. And she had to walk that back immediately because she had a problem. And she now uses the word every time Christine Lagarde will talk about it, fragmentation of the debt markets. And it's absolutely the ECB's job. Absolutely, which is why the ECB is going to go upon quantitative tightening at a far, far slower pace because they have to worry about the, the structural differences in the debt yields. Here, I'm looking this morning and it's been narrowing for some reason. So the German Italian this morning is 176. Five weeks ago, it was out to 250. So it's narrowed as the energy situation has changed. And, and you know, you look at the DAX, so things are, appear to be getting somewhat better in Europe and that's closed those spreads fairly dramatically. But 
this is a serious, far more serious than the JGBs. Because Europe, you know, and Italy's spending like there's no tomorrow, uh, knowing that they've got everybody trapped. You, what are you going to say? You know, look what happened when, when Greece was an issue back in 24, you know, from 2011 to 2014, you know, the Greek tenure went to 40 percent. Yes, that's right. 40 percent. Because they were concerned that the whole EU was going to blow apart and then how were you going to how were you going to value all that debt load. Right. So. I worry much more about Europe, but, and interestingly, Christine Lagarde is one of the great liars in the world, but she's a politician and that's what they, they do. You know, uh, the, the, the classic academic definition of a diplomat is an honest person sent abroad to lie for their country. That's what a diplomat is. And it's, you know, we can laugh about it in tongue in cheek, but Christine Lagarde is in a terrible situation because she has the Germans, the Dutch, yeah, the French don't know what the hell they want. Uh, and some of the more hawkish, the Austrians, and they want to get rid of the ECB balance sheet, just like the Fed does with, you know, with quantitative tightening. And she knows the problem that it'll, that it'll make. So, she the only tool she really has is a more aggressive raising of overnight interest rates to placate the more hawkish members of the ECB. Now there was an article in the FT three weeks ago. It was an inter interview with Klaus Knott. Klaus Knott is a executive member of the ECB, but he also happens to be, as many of my, he's the president of the Dutch Central Bank. And he made this comment. He said, because the, the ECB doesn't publish a vote. So they have 19 voting members. You don't know what the vote is, how they vote. She just will tell you it was unanimous. It was a, but he made the comment in his interview that more than a third of the members wanted to raise 75 basis points when they only rose 50. So the dissension and the disagreement in the ECB is great. And, and that's a problem because there are legal treaty agreements amongst the European nations that they're supposed to adhere to. Well, Christine Lagarde has already blown that up because there's a thing called the capital key and the bonds, and this is coming back to your point, Tracy, the bonds that the ECB buys are, are supposed to be pro rata according to your capital contribution to the ECB balance sheet. So it's called the capital key. But Draghi had already suspended that because he talked about stocks. So they've already thrown that aside because they know that to keep the, the, bond, the European bond market from fragmenting, they're going to have to buy disproportionately. And it's going to lead, lead to a legal challenge but in, from the Germans to the German high court. So there are so many things underlying there. You know, the guards just trying, she's trying to buy for time for things to turn around and get a bit easier. But I worry more about the European bond market. So I do have concerns, Tracy, as you can see, right? Yes, I got it. You answered my question. I mean, the bond markets are something to be very nervous about, I think. But, you know, I'm an outlier because at this juncture, I'm not only, an, I'm not an outlier. There's, there are others who I've discussed. I, you know, I discussed this with Mark Faber, but in a podcast recently, he's a little <laughs> more seguin about it. I talked about it with, because uh, I've done a lot of really good podcasts in the last three weeks. This is the time of year. Uh, and now with Lewis, Lewis is more concerned about it. And I'm concerned about it. I Last year, all the bond bulls got hammered. And there were a lot of bond bulls and highly credible ones. Now they're looking for a rally again. But honestly, 
I need to see a whole lot more. And my attitude is, so let's go back to the U.S. situation. So if, the, if, you, if you believe there's a recession coming and it's going to be, God, I hate the binary basis of a hard landing or soft landing, but if you think it's going to be a hard landing, and that's why you're buying bonds, well, and the Fed just goes on pause, right? They're, they don't go, this concept of a pivot, they don't have to pivot. If they pause with rates at four, at four and a quarter, four and a half percent, and, and the economy slows down, in fact, goes negative, the deficit's going to grow dramatically because they're automatically uh, spending things that kick in and your revenues fall. So the, on a proportion basis, the interest costs are going to rise even more dramatically. So why do I want to own a 10-year fucking note? Sorry for my... It, it, I, I, I scratch my head every day and I go, who would be buying this crap? especially because I can buy a, 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 a two-year. So if you think you're going to buy a 10-year and you think, well, you know, uh, rates are going to, the rates on the long end are going to lower and therefore I'm going to get some capital appreciation. Okay, you're making that bet. I want to know who's making that bet and why they're making it. I find you to be anything but a fiduciary. So I, I just keep looking at this. And I'll also, and th are things tightening up? Yes, they are. And how do I know that? Because we stopped talking about negative nominal yields, right? We are now, we now have zero bonds that actually yield. You know, it wasn't that it was 18 months ago that the German Bund was negative 50 basis points, negative 50 basis points. You had to pay them for the right to own the bonds. So there's no more of those, no more. Because they used to, you know, of course, you know, Wall Street uh, media, and they would always, oh, they're you know, that's why. But I'll tell you this, I'm looking at a sheet, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, two, ten yield curves out of 22 on this sheet that I monitor regularly hmm. have gone inverted. Ten. Jesus. Ten. I didn't realize that. You know, most I've never heard anybody talk about it, but I watch and I go, huh, what the hell is going on here? But it's, it has my attention. But the Fed is still hoping out, to, you know, they, they roll out their, their speakers, you know, and everybody's trying to jawbone uh, the market. But, you know, every, so everything that we talk about, uh, and, and Tracy, your question set off is, I, I just, I'm stepping back because right now it's, not, it's been very difficult to make money shorting the bonds. But so I'm playing the yield curves, but I certainly can't get long bonds. I, I'm willing to give up three and a half percent on a 10 year. And I'm talking about as, a, as an investor. So what I do with my retirement accounts, which is totally different, not with the way I, I'll put on an equity position in those accounts, but with I, I stay flexible, and I've I've been I've just uh, the trading I've been trading the two years, but uh, from investors, everything I have is between six month and one year T bills now, because you know what. I get four and a half percent. I'm not running any capital risk. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, interesting, you should go find the um, Felix Zuloff did a podcast with I, I with what's his name? Uh, RIA, tell, what, what, somebody, somebody like that. And he talked about, you know, so he was looking for rates to come down for a little bit, but he wouldn't, he, I believe, I may be misquoting him, but I believe he said it wouldn't surprise him to see a, an, uh, an aid handle on the longer term bonds by the end of the year. But I don't know, Tracy, whether you heard that or not from it, but it's out there somewhere. I, I don't have it, but it's worth looking. I, I just, and because the model always says that if you think recession is coming, you buy long term debt. But how can I buy something that has been so mispriced for so long because of central bank intervention? I don't know what its real value is. 
So I'd rather stay short. Gives me more optionality and more flexibility. I mean, you basically covered our whole podcast yesterday. So, kidding. If, if we've got an eight handle on there by that by that time, Ira, uh, what's that going to look like for the Fed creating inflation to curb inflation? I, That's gonna get get pretty uh, juicy, right? I I have no idea, but it, that's why I think this year is going to be a, a fascinating year because there are yeah. so, so many things in play, right? Just so many. And, and this Fed talk, this is the inflation that they created and that they wanted. And yet I hear not of uh, not one I owed it, well, it's our fault. In fact, when Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury said, well, she re we really got it wrong on inflation. She got yelled at by, the, by people in the administration. You, you don't admit to that. So- you know, Janet, Janet Yellen is a is a very good economist. She's a terrible politician. Yeah, she's not wrong. Like you said, she's she's an honest person sent to lie abroad. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and she's not good at it. No, well, yeah, and how could you be? But uh, you know, it's it, it's almost like you know, you you are one of the few people that realize they're that's what they have to do to to do that. But they're not gonna, you know, the mainstream is never gonna. They don't want the mainstream to catch on to that, essentially. Well, they can't because they have to keep the veneer, again, of being that they know exactly what they're doing. And the fact that, you know, my problem with the Fed for all these years, you know, when I, because, you know, as I would explain ad nauseum, then I don't buy, you know, anybody who says, oh, you buy gold for inflation. By the time you, you realize the inflation, it's way too late. Gold is to me a bet on on central bank credibility. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and, and how's that one played out as far as it's going to play it out, or is it is it playing out is it going to play out further from here? It, well, and and I say to people, and this is a room that will understand it. With all the hawkish talk. And I'm going, and, and, I, and I'll date, you can date it August 26 from Jackson Hole when Powell really shifted into more. But I would say November 2nd was very important because that was a, that was a, a Fed statement date. That was a Wednesday and the Fed had to be, and they released their statement and it was deemed to be somewhat dovish. And we had a very sizable rally in the currency markets, currency futures, in the gold, and in the equity market and bonds. And then in the press conference, Powell rolled it back. In fact, became very hawkish and everything reversed in that last hour and 20 minutes of trading. Right. So it reversed dramatically. But by Friday, the dollar, the currencies actually closed higher on the week. The gold closed higher on the week after, and the equities realized. So that the market is, it's not that, there, that there's a pivot, they just doubt that the Fed's going to be as aggressive, you know, and I don't care. J Jamie Dimon, you know, the media, oh, Jamie Dimon says we're going to go to five, five, five and a half. The last time Jamie Dimon was right on, any, on anything macro, he was probably an undergraduate. <laughs> well, it, and it's almost like the, the market can see faster than anybody else to read between the lines on, on these subjects. I mean, would you agree yeah. with that? But but right now, the fact that gold is rallying into this quote unquote hawkishness, now everybody will say, well, that's because central banks are buying. Because uh, the central banks did a lot of buying last year, meaning the Chinese, the Russians, the Turks, uh, they bought a lot of gold. The Indians, <coughs> the Indians, central bank. So, yes. And that gets them off the hook because nobody, because wait a minute, yes, the gold is going up, but the inflation's right here. But, but, if real yields, and again, gold is really a reflection of real yields. If real yields are approaching zero, gold should be breaking. But if you go back to, uh, let's go, let's go retrace our steps a little bit. So if I go back to no the date of November 2nd that I'm talking about, um, let's 
take a look at that. Anete, let's see. So Anete, it had a range of 1673, uh, and the low was 1637, and this is on a, all the way up to 4, 4 p.m., and it closed right on its low at 1637. That was after it ran up, and it made its high after the Fed statement that day. So it went up to 1673 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and by 4 o'clock it had closed on its low. But yet, let's see, so yeah, by Friday, it closed at 1685. And yet, all the conversation was hawkish, 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 hawkish. You know, you, you, yeah, you know Nick Timmer, hawkish. You know, something, something changed. Yeah. Something well, changed. Credibility or, or what, what exactly so, it was. Something, right? Because... And the, and the conversation has been more hawkish. You know, when's the last time you've heard any devilish comment or, or perceived to be a devilish comment from all these Fed speakers who are out there? Yeah, the, Powell, yeah. yeah. Powell talking to you. And yet we, we're basically, uh, you know, uh, 200, uh, $280, $250 above the close of that week into hawkish talk. What the hell is going on in the world? Oh, by the way, Zoltan Pozar has an op-ed piece in, in the uh, FT today. I suggest you somebody find it and post it. That'll be good. Zoltan's got a lot of interesting things that talk. Uh, um, scary too. Scary. You know, he. I can't do another podcast with him because Credit Suisse doesn't want him to talk to anybody but certain media. I because I I email with him a lot because I respond to when he writes stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got it. Ira, I wanted to ask you real quick, because speaking about, quote unquote, some some scary things that could potentially happen in the future. I have a hunch, but I, I'd rather ask you what what is your overall thought on Peter Zihan and his overall <laughs> predictions? Now, I've been following him for a couple of years. I think I came across him in an interview he did um early summer of 2020 post covid and he came out and he basically said that you know china is i'll paraphrase china is done uh the the whole world is not going to let them get get off or get away with basically uh everything that happened with covid and i thought okay and then he went on and made a lot of predictions but, uh, you know, he just came out and did a podcast with Joe Rogan. And I think a lot of people had just came to discover him then. A lot of people say he's bullshit. A lot of people say, well, go back and look at some of his other stuff that he said. It's come to fruition. He, he, he talks like he's the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> Which uh, makes him semi-believable because it's like, well, if he's talking like he's the smartest guy in the room, his thoughts are very clear and concise. Maybe he's not a bullshitter or maybe he's very slippery. I don't know, but. Yeah, I, you know what? I can't, I, again, you know, I've seen his tweets go out. And then after he did that Rogan interview, I think it was a two hour interview. Yeah. My wife listened to it out of nowhere. So she says, you know, Peter, my wife is really, really bright and really bright in the world of finance. And she started quoting him to me you know what, uh, it threw me for a loop. I go, wait, because, you know, I, yeah, he came up with these things and and you could say, well, he's probably as well read as you are and, you, and that's probably true and he comes to a different, uh, you know, outcome. I just don't see those. To me, it kind of reminds me of Martin Armstrong or Rickards. <laughs> mm -hmm. he's, he's in that camp. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. He's he's one more voice out there, and he's out there promoting himself. And the yeah. fact that Joe, Joe Rogan put him on elevated him tremendously, as you say, you're 100 percent right. Hasn't elevated him to me. I've seen his stuff, uh, but I'm not a fan of Ian Bremmer either. I think Ian Bremmer's an idiot, a self a self promoting idiot. Now that's not means that he's intellectually, 
not capable, he is. But he tries to put it together to be able to sell it, especially to the corporate world that he's the all knowing when it comes to foreign policy. And then he started uh, putting in uh, global macro analysis. And that was about seven, eight years ago. I started, it was all garbage. It was all garbage. I wrote, I sent an email to him. I, he never got back to me, you know, saying, if you want real global macro analysis, why don't you try me? But, but I have no time for you. Ian Bremmer is just a, you know what? I'm not a John Maudlin fan. Now, John writes really good stuff, too self-promoting for me. Uh, and he always, you know, this is my best friend. This is my, oh, my good friend. You know, I always get in there. That's like politician talk. Oh, my good friend. As soon as they call me their good friend, I know I must have given them a check. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not comfortable with it. You're not, you're not critical enough. And, and to me, I try to be critical. Now, Zion is very critical. But he goes and he makes these predictions, right? There's prediction on China. That's a guarantee. Right, we're gonna, we are gonna choke the the life out of China, you know. As I read, following some of the transcript, and this is gonna happen, and they're not okay. What am I supposed to do with that? Tell me how I'm gonna. Then, then my entire view on the rest of the global economy is is wrong, but I'll be able to adjust. Tell me, and, and that's one of the great things that Louis Gavay always says, and. It, when I did my first podcast with him, he talked about that because we talked about forecasting. And I said, you know, we're discussing these things and you're going to see outcomes. Just what I do in this room. We can discuss things and you might find, well, this thing is like an, a very investable theme. Let me get it in a way, right? I think that's what our goal and that's what our strategy is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Lewis would, would tell you very forthright, my clients, and this is his quote, and I use it all the time. It's a brilliant quote. My clients don't pay me to forecast. They pay me to adapt. Huh. So I'm an adapter. You know, I see a view. I have a view on, on Japan at this, at this moment. Now, how I put that into action and how I, I make it happen, and I talk about it. Because one of my favorite plays, if, I, if I'm going to be right, and I'll know when I'm wrong, is to buy some of the Japanese financials. And if you want to look at the press stocks over the last 30 years, look at Japanese financials. But I've owned, as I said, stupidly, Mitsubishi Tokyo Bank, which is the largest bank in Japan. It's, it trades as an ADR, MUFG, and you can look at the chart. And I've owned it for eight, nine years because to me, it was like owning a bond and the stock has traded between $3 and... Uh, five dollars for so friggin' long because nobody pays attention to it you know because it it doesn't get enough pizzazz so if i go back it, it's been between three and a half dollars and really seven dollars since 2008 but it pays a nice dividend so to me it's like owning a bond but as and i started buying more Right after the, uh, when, when they hit the Nikkei pretty hard, they hit the stocks and then the, then the bank took off. But I'm watching this very carefully. And I talked about it with Faber too. He didn't like the Japanese banks as much as he liked other Asian banks. Uh, and Lewis says the same, he says, ah, you know, I could, I'd rather buy banks in Malaysia or Singapore, but, uh, but, I, I'll, I'll know when I'm wrong. So when people like Zaya, you'll never hear from him. If he's right, he'll be the darling and everybody, CNBC, Bloomberg, well, I don't know if Bloomberg will go to him, but five, they'll have him on. And if he's wrong, you know, it, it's the Joey Granville school of how to tout yourself. <laughs> you, you go big, you make a lot of noise. If you're right, you get to bound your chest. And if you're wrong, you kind of like slant, you know, saunter off until you get the next time. Hey, Eric, I, I have to go. I have to hop off to another meeting, but I just wanted to thank you very, very much um, for, for talking to us today. 
<laughs> Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I mean it. Thank you for listening because, again, I'm familiar enough with your <laughs> your work and I know enough. So the fact that you're willing to put in the time, it's, it means a lot to me. No, well, I really appreciate it. I just wanted to say thank you. Sorry, I had to cut cut out a little bit. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it. Another right. reading. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. This has been a this has been longer than I usually go, but uh, but you asked the right question to kick it off because I I think the world this year of bonds again, and everybody's looking for a global bond rally because of the recession. And uh, again, I'll ch I'll change when I see certain things tell me that it's time to change, but the cost of financing, we, uh, you know, I, I like Nor Noriel Rubini. I like reading him. Uh, do I hang my head out? No, but even he is very concerned about a debt trap, meaning that we, owned, we owe so much money and the cost of financing it traps you. And there aren't, to me, there aren't enough people out there talking about it, but, you know, that's me. Hey, thanks, Tracy. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. All right, Maddie, anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to... Uh... Those are, this was an incredible conversation, Ira, and, and uh, uh, there's just a lot to wrap my head around. A lot. I just, I just sent you the... I sent you the FTPs from Zoltan. Oh, thanks. There's actually a comment from Zoltan on there because I told him to read the threads. I said, you're disrupting the world. Uh, I actually have pretty good conversations with him. When I did that podcast, you know, that got 95,000 hits. It's not because of me, by the way, because my FRA hits usually get about 2,500, 3,000. I'm going to see how many of Louis Gavay is well, to... I listen to it because of you, Ira. Well, thank you. It's uh, you're very you're you're one of the few. But I, you know, but but listen, Zoltan is a power. Zoltan is a power because you know what? He's a good thinker. He doesn't have to be right. I've got four of his last. You know, he put out four pieces. But he hadn't written in quite a while. But in December, he put out four big pieces that got a lot of attention. I haven't. I. I and it's my friend Kevin McCarthy, not the one in Congress, but Kevin James McCarthy, uh, who I went to graduate school with, and he was really a great analyst of global things. Uh, so we were talking about it, and he says, you know, I have to read them three times. I said, the fact that you're saying that, and that I read them three times, says a lot. So people say, well, if you, you can't just read this, read Zoltan. And meanwhile, the academics, because I'll tell you what, uh, Eichengrin took a shot at him in, when I did the podcast with him. And the shot was very quiet, but my radar is up. I pay attention. It's like when Zoltan takes a shot at somebody, I, I called him out for something. And he, uh, he said, oh, you mean that line? I said, yes, that line. I, I, we did it via email. It was pretty funny. I said, oh, I see your take, because he took a shot at you. He said, oh, you caught that. I said, I, I did. But Eichengren took it because he said, oh, yeah, because we were talking about the demise of the dollar as a potential uh, reserve currency, which is Zoltan has been playing his theme. And he said, yeah, there's a certain analyst at the Credit Suisse who's been pushing that. And he couldn't, and I was going to call him on it. What's wrong? You can't say the name Zoltan Pozar? But I... I am not getting involved in the middle of this shit. I read a, uh, um, uh, the other day I read a, uh, a thread on Twitter that had uh, uh, somebody, a Russian speaker had had uh, translated a speech from, from Putin in September uh, that that basically, you know, was complaining. Of, that was saying that the, that the 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 Ukraine war was more about a multipolar world than it was getting away from a you know a world controlled by the U.S. and he went down and listed all kinds of you know things that that they were looking to change. Just made me think and wonder. And I'm looking forward to reading this article. I read the first couple of paragraphs. I love Zoltan Pozar and I love when you guys were together. Okay, I've I've left you with a lot, but I'll tell you, 
I'm not even, don't even listen to the Ike and Green podcast. I haven't even posted it. It was, and it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It's a little dry because he's an academic. Uh, post, and, and then next week we can do this again. And you might have different questions to ask. Oh, yeah. Next week is going to be important, isn't it? I think right now every week is important, by the way. But you got the Fed coming up on January 31st, February 1st. Uh, a, a lot of stuff. And I'll also tell you this. The other day, uh, the Dallas Fed president, uh, Lori Logan, mm -hmm. This she's just now, she gave her first speech that I saw. Read her speech. What a breath of fresh air because she came from the New York Fed. She ran the uh, system open market account. So she was trading the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, she's now the president of the Fed. Read it. And it's a four page speech, very readable. She, she really, uh, but you'll see. Uh, I, 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 yeah, and I'm tired of the way that the mainstream media just spoons it up. Me, you got a challenge. You, when you, if I, I want to be invited to one of those press conferences. I have some questions I really want to ask, huh. but I won't get those. I don't have press credentials. <laughs> and if you did, they wouldn't ask you anyway. You get one question in, and then they, that that'd be the end of it. Well, I asked. You know, I have my famous one question to Jerome Powell, but he wasn't. He was just a governor. That was in uh, in Chicago on June 30th, 2016, when I asked him after he gave a speech at the Chicago Global Initiative. And I was supposed to have dinner with him. I was invited through the CME table. I, I was a member of the Global, that was, that's the old Council of Foreign Relations. Then I got disinvited after I asked my question. <laughs> <laughs> what did you ask him? Well, he had talked about this and the other. Now, remember, this, is, this, was, this was the week after Brexit, the vote just by happenstance, he was scheduled. And I had, I had, as soon as I saw he was coming, I, and I, he wasn't, again, he wasn't the chair, he was the governor, but I knew about his role at Carlisle, so I knew a lot about him. So I went and I asked a question after, he, I asked him the question, I said this, who guarantees the ECB? Huh. And then I had a follow, and he said, they have a printing press. <laughs> That's what he said to me, point point. And then I said, well, do you believe that under Basel, the Basel agreements, sovereign debts, sovereign debt carries a zero risk weighting, a ZWA. Do you believe that that should be the case? He was not very comfortable with that question because that blows open a lot of things. But if you own Greek bonds, they carry a zero risk weighting, so you don't have to reserve against them. If you own Spanish bonds, if you own Italian bonds, you you can own them as a bank, and you're not reserving against them. So, so, so the ECB better have a printing press. <laughs> so, somebody comes up to me and goes, "You know what? Uh, we thought we had room for you at the table. There's no room." <laughs> <laughs> Did they really? Oh yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That, that's amazing. I didn't know that. And, and I mean, that's, I, they only invited me earlier in the day. They said, oh, you know, you might want to, you know, because they found out I, I didn't come through them. They found out I was coming. I guess they, they said, oh, would you, like to, would you like to have dinner? I sure. Sure. <laughs> oh, that's just great. Can't, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I remember, I remember the, the, uh, um, I remember the question. I remember the story, but I don't remember the dinner. I don't remember you getting disinvited. That's, that's great. When, when I told, uh, when I told Pebbles, he was, he was, he went wild. <laughs> was he there? Was no, he... no, no, no. <laughs> crazy. I didn't tell the story though. There's a, but okay, you know, so we, we covered the bond and I think the bonds are, and that I don't have a, a, any kind of magic gate ball to tell you, oh, they're going to rally. Everybody's looking for a rally because they got, you know, put up a TLT chart. You, you, how much were they down last year? If you use TLT, I hate using, you know, I'm a 
futures trader. So, but now for the sake of uh, discussion. So in 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 2022, let's see. On December 31st, TLT, which is the pro, which is the ETF proxy for being long bonds, co in in December 30 of of 2021 closed at 148, and we closed December of 22 at 99.56. That's that's a good 38 percent decline. So everybody's looking for the rally in order, you know, because they were down so much. And that's why they're, and, and the recession gives them a bold call. I'm just not, I'm just not there yet. And as we've talked, the only thing that's happened is that years have been breaking pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. Bonds are getting whacked and equities are rallying again. Right. So again, the S and P bond spread saved itself. By the way, yes, it was it was down to the two hundred day moving average yesterday. That was an interesting that was an interesting move too. That was really interesting. A little bit against the grain. Yeah, but there's so much. I'm not. I think this year is going to be so volatile. And and I, and I would tell you, go back and find see if you can find that zoo off in there. I think it was with our. RIA or somebody like that, uh, Luke, maybe Luke, somebody did an interview with him. It's worth listening to. I'll look for it. Just to build a platform about what's going to go on here. Now you can go day to day and that's fine because you're going to see nothing. But I mean, you get enough volatility every day? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. It's, Traders, we can't ask for anything more than that. Yeah, right. The algorithms are driving this stuff and they're, they're all headline driven, you know. And at any time, you can uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, and any, you, you're going to see all kinds of movement. But at any moment, you can get an announcement of a ceasefire in the Ukraine, right? Yep. Because there's movement about that, by the way, quietly. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that that'll give us a rally across a myriad of things will probably hurt some commodity prices, but. Uh, which would, which would add fuel to the rally. There, oh, there's God, yes. Things oh, things God, yes. On. So many different things going on. And so, oh, you know what, there is so much going on. And you know what, again, because if you, if you get your news from television, they only can show you a narrow focus. You, you, you have to read and that doesn't mean you should you know it's like uh who was that was who raised that question mark about zaya peter zaya yeah it was mark yeah i mean when my wife started citing that to me and i and i like you know i it doesn't mean i have to agree uh that i have to agree with with joe rogan but i respect joe rogan's ability to go out and really seek out things that are outside the uh, accepted narrative. All right, one more time. How do you say that German word uh, for, for uh... I'll spell it for you and you should look it up. Z-E-I-T-E-N. It's in the thing I sent you from Toby, W-E-N-D-E, -E. yes. Zeitenwende. Zeitenwende. Right and bending. Okay, I'm going to start using that word a lot. Throwing, sprinkling in, in and out of uh, um, conversation. It's it, you. It is a theme from uh, policymakers that uh, you can look it up. Uh, the, uh, historical. It's a, uh, a a historical turning, and there are things that are going to lead to that. So. You know, is Zion, is he looking through the world through those parochial and, and common views? Maybe. I've never looked at the world through common views. That doesn't make me right. But, you know, I'm a fourth son, and my whole life has been about challenging everything. Hmm. And it's carried me over into everything, uh, into everything that I've ever approached. I, I look at it with uh, 
and I approach it with uh, um, uh, always an eye going, well, do I want, how do I accept that? Uh, do I accept that? But I don't just jump at it. I research it. I spend my time reading so much. People say, you're working. I said, yeah. I, and it's just like Chuck and I were having, I said, how do I walk away from building a foundation between graduate school? So I, I'm almost at 50 years, not quite 48 years of certainly doing this. And then, you know, be, becoming involved in the investment world, then I get put, was able to put it to practice and continual learning, 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 learning. So that's the way I approach it. As, as we started these conversations, Matt, everything I do is about context and nuance. That's right. Can't get away from it. And that's what I try to do because that's where the, that's my, that's my edge. 